and tune into the energy of our little group. Maybe Ruben and myself, feeling our energy, the vibration. We are animals and we're constantly assessing our environment, people, animals around us. How do we make you feel? And then tune into yourself, bring a little check in of the body. How do I feel today? What's going on in my body? What if I just listen to my body right now for a minute or so and just, just check in? How do I feel? invite you if your energy was all over the place if your thoughts were all over the place there is a lot going on around the world just for the next hour bring yourself here and now in a little container maybe turn on your camera see you can feel you Maybe set an intention for this hour. Why am I here? The invitation is for you to keep this breathing pattern throughout our call, just to allow yourself to stay in your body, stay present with your breath, allowing a lot of this incredible information that Ruben is going to share with us. Dive in, to arrive in your body, to receive it fully and just acknowledge whether you're receiving it or you're rejecting it. Very important to always assess how this make me feel. You can take three breaths to open. Everyone fully in and out. In and out. One last time, inhale. And let it go. Welcome, welcome everyone. I am stoked, honored, excited for our monthly call. So my name is Alex from Breathing Call here in Bali on this day of Nyepi, day of silence. <clears throat> Feeling, I said, like a bad boy organizing a call on this day. So don't tell anyone this, I'm doing this. But it is a, a long scheduled call with uh, Ruben Merriman, and I'm very honored and excited um, to hear him. As you know, I'm passionate about anything related to the breath. And lately, I'm exploring the relation between breath and sleep and what's going on and what's the purpose of sleep. And, and what I can tell you is that I'm never stopped to be amazed by what I learn when I tune into how the body works. And we are very fortunate today to welcome someone extremely knowledgeable, a biologist who is gonna go into the needs and bits of what's going on in our body. So the way it's gonna work, he's gonna talk to us, share, I'm gonna ask you questions and I'll let him flow because he's very used to these talks. And then, um, after that, I'll take it some questions. So if you guys want to feed me the chat room with your questions, we'll make sure that we uh, have time for them. All right, without further ado, welcome, Ruben. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you guys are. We have people from, I know, Los Angeles coming in and other parts of the world. So acknowledging everyone. So Ruben. Tell us a little bit what's going on on your side of the world. What are you What are you working on these days? Uh, at the moment, I am working on a project uh, in my hometown, actually, which I, I don't live there, but um, where I grew up uh, in Bundaberg. There's um, I've been working on this for I think four years now. 
with the local primary schools and high schools um, and the local council to start teaching every primary school child that the food they eat gets turned into the carbon dioxide they exhale, which is, um, it just doesn't happen anywhere in the world at the moment because we don't teach children about uh, atoms until they get to high school. So there is nowhere in the world at the moment where a primary school child, so kids younger than 12, there's nowhere where they, they learn that, you know, the atoms that you eat in food come back out of your lungs as carbon dioxide. And um, my uh, hope is that that will help them to lead a healthier life as they grow up. Just that little bit of knowledge, just understanding that you eat food, it makes your body a bit heavier. You slowly burn it, which means turn it into carbon dioxide. You slowly breathe it back out and that's how your body weight comes back down. That's pretty much all I want these kids to learn and then see what happens over the course of five to 10 years. Um, they ask lots of questions. So it's not the only thing they'll learn. But as soon as you tell kids that or adults that they've just, the questions start just absolutely flying out of them. So so um, I'm pretty excited at the moment. We're getting pretty close to being able to launch this project sort of officially. It's not, it's not official yet, but I've been working with the local regional council so um, and all the local schools. And hopefully uh, I'll have a, a meeting in just two weeks time to try and get some serious funding to really get cracking. So yeah, that's... I mean, that's if you go there, it's a rabbit hole of actually teaching kids things that they need to learn rather than useless information that we, they are being fed to just feed the matrix and be part of a society that is serving its own interest as a beast and not really honoring people. It's completely insane that we have no idea how our body works, where are our organs, the purpose of our organs. I mean, things are, you know, you buy something, you buy any machinery at one stage, you want to understand, okay, I have this computer, I'm learning about the computer and how it works. But we have no idea how things work. And we completely rely on, you know, doctors and, and the chemical industry to uh, to give us, fix us the same way we fix our cars. It's, oh, you know, that's the job of the, of the garage is yeah. taking care of the car. It's the job of the yeah. doctor to take care of me. So we're completely disconnected from our bodies, have no idea what's what's going on. And, and as a result, we're not able to use this amazing machine of ours. And, and it's, it's completely insane that, you know, you are talking about teaching kids, teach us, man. We have no clue either. So well, yeah, and, it, that, that's, and the, the issue is that the uh, sequence of the science curriculum, I've been working with schools for 25 years. Uh, and if you look at the sequence in which science is taught to children, there's a really weird fact about this, and it is true of every Western country's science curriculum. We don't teach them that everything's made out of atoms until they're about 13 or 14. And that's because of the work of a cognitive developmental psychologist called Jean Piaget, who was like, did great work in the early 1900s. But another French, another French man, eh? Yeah, yeah. And he, he was terrific. So I've sort of criticised his um, stages of cognitive development, but I'm not criticising his work. He, he did really important stuff. But I just think we all would now agree, um, anyone who works with little kids, you know, four, five-year-old children, they actually have the best imagination that you can find on the planet. They can really picture things in their little minds. They're amazing learners. But because of Piaget's stages of development, um, teachers are taught that those little kids can't imagine abstract concepts like the fact that this big thing that I'm looking at is made out of tiny atoms that are too small to see on their own. But I, I believe that they can understand that and lots of people do, but that's why we don't teach it. So, so I look happy to tell you guys as well. Of course, that's why I'm here. Um, but I should preface the fact that, you know, I, I think that the only way we're going to make big change in the world is if we really start with kids, you know, they need to know this stuff before they reach puberty, which is when their bodies start to change and they start to, you know, eat um, away from home a lot more and they can grab their own food and decide what to put in their mouth as, as opposed to when they're little, we give them everything that they eat. When you so, know better, you do better. So that's yeah, it, having exactly. a bit of awareness of things. So, you know, yeah. 
don't think of us as a bit more evolved than a, a, a 10 year old because we're probably not, I know I'm not. So please treat us like 10 years old and explain to us what's okay. going on. How does this magic formula works? I'm, I'm gonna use the uh, some of the resources I am providing to the schools in Bundaberg to actually help the teachers do this, right? So I've got these little, these are invented um, little plastic balls to represent atoms and they're color coded. Um, so red atoms in, when you look in a textbook, um, when we draw atoms in textbooks, they're not really red, but oxygen, we, we make them red so that we know that when there's a red sphere on the page, uh, the person writing this means oxygen. And white spheres, um, when we draw a white one, that's hydrogen atoms. And so we all know the formula H2O, which is water. Well, what that means is two hydrogen atoms stuck to a water molecule. My sister didn't know that, and she's 60. Uh, she, when I showed her these a couple of uh, year ago, she was like, oh, is that what H2O means? So, you know, there's a lot of people who have missed this really fundamental stuff. So um, if you take two oxygen atoms and stick them together uh, with these, little, they've got little magnets in them, these um, little toy models. They're fantastic for teaching just basic chemistry. So the oxygen that you and I breathe is made out of, each molecule is made out of two oxygen atoms, hence we write the word O2. And here's the thing about uh, breathing that most people just have never thought about until you, you ask them this question. So we, we breathe in these tiny molecules of oxygen, each made out of two oxygen atoms. They go you know, up your nose or in your mouth and all the way down into your lungs. But when they come back out again, there's no longer just um, oxygen in your breath. You breathe out, as you all know, carbon dioxide. So out come the two oxygen atoms, but now there's this black oxygen atom stuck in between them. And the big question that most people don't know the answer to is how, how did that carbon atom get inside your body so that you could breathe it out? And being able to show kids that, you know, we're talking about physical objects in the universe. They take up space, they have mass, they just happen to be invisible, but you, uh, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, and that carbon has to come from somewhere. And the answer is, comes from your food. And so um, I won't bother making all the big food molecules, but, you know, carbohydrates are the clue for people to think about. The word carbohydrate means carbon atoms that have been hydrated by, um, well, if I put one together, it's, it's say glucose is the most important carbohydrate in the universe. It's made out of six carbon atoms, six oxygens and 12 hydrogens. So it's a carbon atom or six carbon atoms that have been hydrated by essentially water molecules. And so that's uh, one of the, the, the three major macronutrients, carbohydrates. It's all just made out of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. You eat it, you breathe it, back out same goes for fat um, so every fat molecule in nature whether it comes from a plant so olive oil or sunflower oil or you name it soy um, or if it comes from an animal all the way from insects through to whales um, all of the fat in nature is just carbon hydrogen oxygen and if you eat it you've got to breathe the carbon atoms back out and then the third Actually, there's four macronutrients. One of them is alcohol, which most people don't think of it as a macronutrient, but alcohol, um, ethanol, is two carbon atoms, six hydrogens, and one oxygen makes one little ethanol molecule. So if you drink alcohol, you take in this, it's dissolved in a liquid. So, you know, you're drinking this liquid, but you're going to vaporize that liquid inside your body and breathe out the carbon atoms again. It takes about an hour to... Uh, turn all of the ethanol in one standard drink, it takes about one hour to convert that all back to carbon dioxide and breathe it out again, which is why if you drink, say, five beers in an hour, you can't turn it back into carbon dioxide fast enough and the alcohol level builds up in your blood and you get drunk. Um, whereas if you just drink one an hour, you, you can just keep that churning over. And, um, so, and the fourth macronutrient is uh, protein 
And if you zoom in on a protein and look at the atoms that it's made of, it's made out of, well, molecules called amino acids all strung together in a big long chain. And those amino acids, if you zoom into their atoms, they're all also just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, plus nitrogen. Um, and the nitrogen in protein, you turn into urea and you pee that out. So you breathe out most of what's in protein and a little bit comes out of your bladder after you've burnt it. And there's, there's one more atom in protein, which is sulfur. Um, and sulfur turns into sulfate, actually sulfuric acid and then sulfate. And you, you pee that out as well. So out of the four um, macronutrients that you eat in a meal, um, you know, a, a meal, let's say you've got a big plate full of food and all of it weighs 300 grams. Most of that weight in your food is just moisture. So just H2O. And then there's some macronutrients. And out of the macronutrients, 75%, um, three quarters of the weight of the macronutrients that you eat, you breathe back out in the form of carbon dioxide. And only a few percent, like three or so percent, you turn into uh urea and sulfate, which you pee out, and the remainder becomes just pure fresh water, H2O. It's bloody amazing, you know, just wonderful stuff to know. It, it, it's um, it's kind of, it's life-changing, I think, to just understand the fact that you eat stuff, you breathe it out. It's amazing. It's, it, it is fascinating. And at the same time, I, my, my, my mind as a breathwork coach is thinking, hmm, and I know the answer, but I want you to, I, I know it's a qu question that you get asked all the time. So I'm going to ask it. So if I want to lose weight, all I need to do would be to breathe out more. Yes. And, you're and, and that, is, that is correct. Um, with a little bit of nuance, if you just breathe more, while you're sitting still, then you're not increasing your actual energy expenditure while you're sitting still. You, you, you don't need to burn that much fuel to sit still. So breathing more doesn't increase your metabolic rate very much at all. It, it will a little bit because you're, the muscles that drive your breathing, you know, all your respiratory muscles, you, you are using them a bit more than you need to, but that doesn't really add a very substantial amount of energy expenditure to what you're doing sitting still so if, if you do breathe a lot more than you need to let's say you know you just sit here and hyperventilate as much as you can people who do breath breath work um, probably know that you know you, you will uh, get dizzy and um, most most people who've done breath work know a little bit about the fact that you're breathing out more carbon dioxide than you need to breathe out if you do that when you hyperventilate and one of the interesting side effects of breathing out too much carbon dioxide, as in you're breathing out more than you're producing. So as you keep doing that, the amount of CO2 stored in your body is coming down. And the effect of that on your blood is that it decreases the pH, which, uh, sorry, increases the pH, goes up, which means it becomes less acid, more alkaline. And that drives a whole constellation of other interesting knock-on biochemical effects. And the way you experience that uh, biochemistry is you'll feel dizzy, you get tingly fingers, you might faint if you do it for too long. Um, so, but to answer your... Sorry. Just, to, just to stop you there, because that's a, a, a one that is very important, and I'll let you continue. But my understanding, and I'm happy for you to correct me, is that it's the CO2 that binds the oxygen to the hemoglobin. So the, the dizziness, the fizzy sensations is the lack of distribution of oxygen from my lungs to my organs because the CO2 dropping, and it's, I think it's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R effect, that is not allowing the binding of the oxygen to the hemoglobin. And as a result, I have you know this dizziness and I, what they call alter state of consciousness when all of a sudden I'm not there because there's not enough oxygen going to my brain. So I, the way I was trained is, well, you want to keep that CO2. You don't want to let go of the CO2 and you want to learn to breathe less. From a performance perspective, you want to reduce your breathing and it would be the buteco and oxygen advantage where you will never be encouraged from a physiological benefits to breathe more. So I'm trying to make sense of of that as well. 
Yeah, it's really, uh, it's extremely counterintuitive what's going on with the urge to drive and where your respiratory centers in your brain get the urge to take a breath. Um, so uh, there is the Bohr effect and there's also the Haldane effect. They're two very important effects in terms of uh, the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. But there's more going on because when you breathe out more carbon dioxide than you need to, this alkalizing effect um, drives a whole bunch of biochemistry, which, I mean, it's uh, the, what's going on in your respiratory centers is that they can only notice how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. They don't notice how much oxygen is in your blood. There's no little sensor for oxygen levels in the respiratory part, uh, sensors in your brain. We do have some, and I don't quite fully understand how those little oxygen sensors work, but that it's much easier to think about um, carbon dioxide in, the, in the, this way because carbon dioxide does a really interesting thing when, it, um, when you react it with water. So if you have a soda stream at home that you use to um, carbonate your uh, water, you'll know that all you're doing is under pressure, pumping some carbon dioxide through your water. And then when you take it out, suddenly it's got bubbles in it. And when you drink it too fast, it hurts your, well, it, it tingles your face, right? So that's the carbonic acid that forms when you carbonate water. And the same thing happens to your blood. When you hold your breath, your instead of, so we're going on the other side, instead of, instead of hyperventilating, we're just holding our breath. When you do that, your body's still producing lots of carbon dioxide, even at your resting metabolic rate, you know, about 200 milliliters uh, per minute while you're sitting there. And if you stop breathing it out, it builds up in your body. And now you've got more CO2 in your blood and CO2, I'll see if I can show you this with my little sticky atoms here. I haven't done this live in front of a camera, but the, um, see if I can show you the reaction, oops, sorry phone was trying to ring, show you the reaction between a water molecule and a H2O molecule. The, um, all of these atoms are going to stay in my hands here, right? So I'm not going to get rid of any of them. But what happens when you react these two, the bonds that hold them all together come apart. And so you get a bond coming apart. Well, actually, I'll leave, yeah, I'll leave that one there. That one comes apart. And I'm taking the hydrogens off um, one of the water of one of the hydrogens off the water molecule. So now I've got this little arrangement here. Let me hold it back a bit. This is called carbonic acid and it's just made out of carbon dioxide and water. And the more you hold your breath, the more of this you make. And what's not obvious from this little model, so don't feel like you're watching something and you should be seeing something that you're not. This little next step is not obvious, but what happens to carbonic acid is one of its hydrogen atoms, or actually just the proton of that hydrogen atom, easily comes off and causes your, that's what we pretty much call the acid part of what acid is. It's when a, high, when a proton comes off a molecule and it sticks to another water molecule, it's giving off that proton that makes something acid. And you're left with, this is now called carbonate. And you've heard of sodium carbonate, which is baking soda. Well, this is the carbonate part of sodium carbonate, which you also have in your blood. So just taking a step back again, so that we'll, we'll go through what happens when you hold your breath and what happens when you breathe too much. When you breathe too much, when you uh, hyperventilate, you're getting rid of so much CO2 that you're driving the pH of your blood towards alkaline. When you hold your breath, you drive it the other way towards acid. And it, your brain notices that acid uh, feeling, that pH inside your brain, which is independent of how much oxygen there is in your blood, which is, it's really counterintuitive. And it's one of the big risks for people who go um, diving with just, you know, a snorkel. If you hyperventilate before you go down, you'll blow off all this CO2 your blood goes alkaline and um, you can't sense how much oxygen you've got. So you can get into the trouble of uh, 
being so low on oxygen that you can't sustain your metabolic processes anymore, but you still got uh, you still haven't got very much CO2. So your brain's not telling you that you need to breathe, even though you really do need to breathe. It's not going to tell you you need to breathe because you blew off too much CO2. And that's how people, uh, and it happens all the time. They have a, sh a thing called shallow water uh, blackout. Happened here on the Gold Coast um, last year to a really famous um, uh, snowboarder and he was a doing free diving and he sounds like this awesome dude who really knew what he was doing, but he suffered black water, um, so shallow water blackout. So that's if you hyperventilate. Um, if you hold your breath, then you start getting this buildup of CO2. And that's a really big problem for people with anxiety. Um, if you've read James Nestor's book, Breath, he covers this quite well, I think. I mean, I, it's hard to know. I read that book and I, I understood exactly what he was saying. So I don't know what it's like to read that book without sort of a little bit of biochemical knowledge. Um, but what he was saying was, you know, it's all spot on science in that book. Um, that if you hold your breath or if you don't, if you shallow breathe and you're not getting rid of enough CO2, the pH of your blood starts becoming too acidic and um, that's bad as well. So there's, there's, there's kind of a happy medium there. And um, I mean, my, under um, my understanding is it's the CO2 being the biggest stressor. If you are able to handle the stress of the increase of carbon dioxide is kind of mentally preparing you to handle stress better. So for me, the CO2 tolerance uh, is a good thing. Yeah. And, and my understanding is that it also has amazing health benefits in terms of improvement of oxygenation of my organs. And often one of the reasons we are not healthy is just that the oxygen doesn't move enough into uh, our bodies. Um, yes, I, I'm not an expert on this by a long shot, but um, what you're saying is precisely what I've also, you know, I, I probably as knowledgeable as, as you are, we, I think we're on the same page with all that stuff because that, that's really so, not my expertise. Let's, so let's um, go back to your, to your expertise on, on weight loss because I'm still I'm, uh, interested in, uh, not necessarily if there is a link to weight loss yet, completely clear on, because um, I mean, my understanding is when people want to lose weight, they put clothes on and they sweat a lot. So they want to lose weight through the the sweat through the water that they are that they are losing um and for me that was more important than the that hyperventilating so um would you say that hyperventilating while exercising or while running from right. a weight loss perspective is the way to go or yes. yeah yeah. So when, when you're trying to lose weight, we should probably establish what that weight is that people want to lose because you don't want to lose too much water. Um, otherwise, you become dehydrated and you're in trouble. So, you know, people know that before a boxing match, uh, boxers to get down to the weight they need to, they'll often, you know, do things like sit in the sauna and sweat out as much water as they can. Um, and, you know, you can lose up to a, a kilo or two, a kilo, a liter or two liters per hour if you work really hard in very high temperatures you just just through sweat so that that's a lot of weight to lose in uh, two hours but it's all water the moment you have a drink of water it's all back again so you're not trying to lose water when people who are um, trying to lose weight they're trying to lose fat and um, the fat that we want to lose is stored inside specialized cells which they're function is to store fat and they're called adipocytes, adipose tissue. And an adipocyte is an amazing little cell that they're 80% of their weight is just a blob of fat in them, which is a huge amount of fat to have inside one cell. And um, when, you, when you're trying to lose weight, what you're trying to do is reduce the size of that droplet. So turn the fat, which is called triglyceride, it's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You've got to turn that fat droplet into carbon dioxide and water. Breathe out the carbon dioxide, the water you will recycle. When you lose 10 kilograms of fat, of just that triglyceride, um, out of the 10 kilograms that started off as fat, after you've burnt it, 
8.4 of those kilograms will now be carbon dioxide and the other 1.6 kilograms turn into water. Um, so yeah, when you're trying to lose weight, it's all about breathing out the carbon that's in those fat cells, but to make that happen faster than it would if you were just sitting still at home and um, watching television, the only way you can speed it up is to do some exercise, like move your muscles so that you are burning more fuel per minute uh, than you do when you're sitting still. And funny enough, an ice bath will uh, raise your metabolic rate up to, uh, up to 6.6 .6 times above the resting rate. So that's a really, really brisk walk worth of uh, energy expenditure. And the reason that happens, we can come back to this, but the reason that happens is your body's trying to defend your, your core body temperature, right? It's producing more heat to replace the heat that you're losing into the ice bath around you. Um, but yeah, to lose weight, you have to, and to lose weight faster than you would by simply, since, there's two ways to lose weight, really. One is don't eat so much carbon as you're breathing out. And you can do that by simply eating less. And if you take it all the way to its extreme, total starvation, you can't eat less than eating nothing. Um, when you completely starve yourself, you'll lose about 150 grams a day, 200 grams a day, depends on your starting size. And I mean, that has been shown over and over again in prisoner of war camps during the horrors of World War II. We know that the rate that people lose weight is around that sort of mark, 100 to 150 grams a day. Um, when the, uh, the uh, prisoners in um, Ireland went on the hunger strike, and I think nine of them died um, in the 1980s, you might remember, um, there was a paper published about the rate at which they lost weight, that was, I think it was in the New England um, Medical Journal, where, you know, these doctors said, this is a terrible tragedy. Um, but amazingly, we can still learn something from these people who put themselves through this ordeal. And again, you know, they, they lost weight. All they did was drink water. They weren't doing exercise. They were stuck inside a jail and they lost about 150 grams a day. And they lasted for three months. So it's pretty amazing what your body can do if you stress it to the max. The lasting for three months without any food is just amazing. They weren't big overweight people to start with. They were just, you know, yeah. pretty healthy young blokes. So, I mean, does that sort of help to start to answer the question about the link between breathing and how, you, how your body loses that weight? Yes, it's incredible. And, and I think a big one, which I don't know, for me is surprising is, we shouldn't try to lose weight through sweating mm. because that's that's i think and i'm not probably not the only one i can see that a lot of people around the world they they they, they put like you know those extra clothes or they go to the sauna with the intention oh. of losing weight right i i didn't realize that that's um such a, a popular um in asia, in asia we have this uh people putting a lot of clothes and 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 kind of raincoats in during their running because they just want to sweat 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 it sweat it out but it's 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 it is not it, it's not working you're not losing you're just losing water and yeah. and, and you're going to go back to homeostasis and get your body's going to ask for it and right. often when we I, I i when we're hungry we're thirsty actually we're not really hungry so the body is telling you you need you need to hydrate more. How, do you know how much water we? The, because there's, I hear it so many times, and I'm not sure of the right number. How much l water do we need every day according to our body size? Yeah, this is. Uh, it comes up like once a year. You'll read an article in uh, every newspaper, every magazine about health. It just comes up all the time. How much water should you drink? And it really depends on what you're doing. Um, so I wrote a book about how this weight loss thing works about eight years ago, and I covered uh, a couple of extreme cases of people uh, who refused to drink water and how long they survived. And the first recorded case of that was a Corsican on the island of Corsica, a guy who lasted about a fortnight with no water. Um, but he was in cold weather and he was in stuck in a jail and he just refused to drink water and um, eventually died another really amazing case 
really tragic case in the medical literature is of a woman who had um, suffered some terrible bouts of cancer and then they were she just refused to take any more operations. She was kind of tired of all the operations and she was about 70. Um, so she decided to refuse all nutrition, um, water and food. And the nurses all supported this lady and just tried to keep her really uh, comfortable. So they wet her lips with an ice cube, but they, she didn't drink any water. She lasted for over two weeks as well. I mean, it depends on what you're doing is, is the point I'm trying to make. Because if you're out in working in the sun in a really humid climate, working really hard or running, you're going to lose a lot of water. So you, you might need to drink a litre of water per hour just to get it all back again, you know. Um, and so the, the dietitians that I've heard speaking about this, who I kind of trust the most, have been saying of late that um, uh, the colour of your urine is probably one of the best indicators. It should be straw coloured. It shouldn't be dark yellow. The moment it starts to go darker and darker, you, you need to start drinking water because your body's trying to conserve it. And, and you eat most of your water. So it's actually not water you drink, but most of the water comes from, from, from food. And it's actually more filtered and, and, and structured if, if it's eaten rather than just water from the tap, right? Um, yeah, well, what food is like out of, I did the statistics on an average Australian person's diet a couple of years ago and showed like how much uh, water they consume as just pure liquid water out of straight from the tap. Then on top of that, most people drink tea and coffee or some kind of beverage like that. Um, so it was about a third of the water almost that most Australians get comes from the moisture in the food that they eat, which makes sense when you think about it. Like, you know, we've all made rice. We know that it starts off dry before we cook it. You chuck it in a pot with some water and it absorbs a heck of a lot of that water into it. You eat that, but you're eating water like, you know, it's still H2O. It hasn't changed chemically. It's just that it's now infiltrated into the rice grains and it's still there and it'll come back out as water again too. So here's a great fact about water though. The oxygen that you inhale, um, which starts off, you know, as two uh, oxygen atoms stuck together. I, I did not learn this until I was 42 years old. I had no idea that the oxygen you inhale gets those atoms get broken up inside your mitochondria they get literally split by an enzyme and they get married up to hydrogen atoms which came from the food that you ate so all of the oxygen that you inhale gets converted into um, water first complete spin out because then it makes you think well, okay, if all of the oxygen I'm breathing in becomes water, then when I'm breathing out carbon dioxide, where do those oxygen atoms come from? Because I would have thought that they're the ones you breathed in, but they're not the ones you breathed in. They come from water. It's uh, just this beautiful convoluted network of biochemical pathways that intersect in all these places. And um, so when you do the mathematics on this, um, out of all of the oxygen that you breathe in, one ninth, one out of, so yeah, one over nine, um, one ninth of them come back out as CO2 because they become water first and then some of that water reacts with the food that you ate and it comes back out again. It's just wonderful. It really makes you appreciate your body a little bit more, I think, to know that it's doing these amazing tricks with the food you eat. And to, to do those tricks, you've got to make sure that you've had all your vitamins and minerals because all of these enzymes that do that stuff, like the one that splits water, sorry, the one that splits oxygen in half so that you can stick hydrogen to it, it's part of an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase. Um, it uses a copper atom, I think. Yeah, copper. So if you don't have a little tiny bit of copper in your food, you don't want to eat, you know, copper wires. It's got to be in a bioavailable form. But the point that I love making to children about this is that the tricks that you're doing just to stay alive rely on all these different kinds of atoms. There's uh, beyond the 
macronutrients, there's 14 minerals that we know of that you have to eat, like iodine, um, magnesium, sodium. You need all that in your diet. If you, if you don't have those in your diet, you become really sick because your body can't do all the tricks it needs to do. Um, and so there's another really good reason to teach children about atoms when they're young, right? So that you can explain to them the reason we want you to eat fruits and vegetables is so that your body gets all the little parts it needs to build up these amazing molecules that you're made of so you can live a healthy life. I want you to come teach my, my kids. <laughs> so Ruben, let's try to understand now things that we could apply. So if we want to lose weight, we need to breathe more atoms than we eat. So it's that balance of, okay, how much calorie am I getting in and how much I'm breathing out? Um, one of the modalities is of breath work is this connected mouse breathing that we call holotropic breath work when all of a sudden you are breathing a lot for a long time can be for one or two hours of <sighs> have you come across any study which would say okay this is how much weight you're losing if let's say i'm breathing like that consistently for one hour how much weight, uh, uh, kilos of fat am I going to lose? Yeah, well, I've, I've done the maths myself. It's, it, no one publishes it in this way because energy became the dominant way of explaining people, to people how to balance your diet. And when you're uh, interested in weight loss, it's very hard to see the connection between calories and how much weight do I lose, and it's very convoluted. So you can do that maths pretty easily though. Um, and I've got a calculator, which uh, it's a work in progress. So um, I've got a calculator on my website that where you just, all you need to know is you type in your weight, your height, your age and your gender, and also what kind of diet you consume. So there's five bits of info there. Um, the diet information is, are you on a ketogenic diet or do you eat a a sort of standard diet that has carbohydrates in it. I'll come back to why that's important. But if you tell me those five things, your age, your height, your weight, your gender, and what diet you're on, there's a standard equation. It's used to calculate how much oxygen your body requires per minute, which is directly related to energy expenditure. So we can calculate that, you know, for a 70 kilogram person, you need about 200 milliliters of oxygen per minute but i prefer to turn that into how much that oxygen weighs what's its mass um and we don't think of the mass of gas very often like a balloon full of pure oxygen looks exactly like a balloon full of just normal air and most people don't think about how much does that air inside that balloon weigh because it feels weightless and the reason it feels like it's got no mass is because it's in a sea of exactly the same stuff. So to explain that to children, the reason we don't notice the mass of the air in a balloon is the same as the reason you won't notice the weight of a bottle of water full to the brim with the lid screwed on. If you jump in the swimming pool and hold that bottle of water underwater, it feels weightless, right? It, you can't tell it's got mass, same thing. But the mass that you're inhaling and the mass that you're exhaling, it's got physical mass and um so here's the number that you're after um a person my size i lose about seven grams of carbon per hour when i'm sitting still so if i sit and breathe for two hours then i'll lose about 14 grams of carbon from my body and um uh that, that's literally how much lighter my body will be roughly after that two hours. But we're also going to lose water through moisture in our breath and you lose quite a bit of moisture with every breath. You all, you all know this because you can fog up a mirror with your breath, right? Well, that's water coming out of you and that adds to the amount of mass that you're losing. But in terms of just how much fat you lose during two hours of any kind of breathing that's just sort of staying fairly still and just breathing, about 14, 15 grams. It's not a lot. No, when it's, not, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a lot. Um, two things I want us to talk about. 
One is because you touched it is ice baths, and I'm curious if there is more you want to share on ice baths because it's a personal well, passion of mine. Yeah, well, funny enough, last year there was this excellent review. I'll hold it up for you because I was stoked when this came out. It's from the Journal of Applied Physiology. I'll send it to you, Alex, and you can share it with um, yeah. your, because it sits behind a paywall. But this review is, the title is Examining the Benefits of Cold Exposure as a Therapeutic Strategy for Obesity and Type 2 Diabetes. So um, this is probably the top physiology journal in the world. And um, it's like literally just came out last year. It's an excellent summary of what we know to date about the effects of having uh, cold exposure on, um, you know, so for instance, your metabolic rate, how fast you're losing carbon through your lungs, it increases if in an ice bath, it, it increases up to six times above your resting metabolic rate. That's equivalent to, as I said earlier, you know, that's equivalent to walking very briskly with a backpack. Um, so it really does have a big impact on not just that, though, there's a whole bunch that if you read this article, one of the things that you should take away from it is that we're only just at the very beginning mm. of learning what's actually going on there. And so these um, physiologists have said there's really some very promising um, work showing that it might be extremely useful for treating type 2 but diabetes. It might be very useful for treating obesity. But you probably know better than I that getting people to jump into an ice bath is it's uh, people probably wouldn't just put their hand up to want to do that. Um, I think most of the people I've seen who are really into it are very interested in their health and they're trying to be really they're highly motivated about how they feel and, you know, getting very healthy. The people that we're trying to reach with obesity uh I uh, don't want to say anything judgmental, but they don't tend to be as um, motivated to do the sorts of really extreme stuff like getting into a, an ice bath as, you, as we need them to be. So, um, but yeah, I, there's not much that I can tell you. Cool. Apart no, from yeah. the fact. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The one little awesome thing that I didn't know until I read this um, review is that when you expose yourself to cold, um, the ratio of the fuel types you burn changes as well. So you, you burn through a heck of a lot of carbohydrates very quickly, glucose, essentially, um, because your muscles start twitching and you also uh, switch on a form of fat called brown fat. Now, I'm guessing you've heard all about brown fat being into ice baths. Yeah. So that, that can, that's got the same metabolic uh, rate as muscle when it's working really hard. So that's an impressive thing for these little fat cells to just be able to sit there and generate all this heat without actually, you know, having to contract and um, and relax again. So it, it's a fascinating and and the brown um, fat and the brown fat is a precursor to burn white fat, right? It's also the, so creating brown fat is also easing and introducing to the loss of white fat that from my understanding there is correlation between the the, the two you, you can't you can convert uh this is again this is all quite recent um knowledge so ba newborn babies are born with quite a bit of this um tissue called brown fat it's different to the sort of fat that you we have as adults under our skin and around our organs um which is called white fat brown fat has more of these little organelles in them called mitochondria, which is where your food and fat gets turned into carbon dioxide that's in mitochondria. Um, so babies have this brown fat so that when they're first born, they can maintain their body temperature um, a little bit better than uh, if you didn't have it. So as they get older, it was thought that most adults don't have any brown fat left until it was discovered in the 1990s that actually people who work in a cold climate outdoors have more brown fat left in them than people who work and stay inside in warm If you don't use it, you lose it. Yes. So right. Babies lose their brown fat because they are covered in clothes all the time, but they have the innate ability to heat up their bodies. If at night they're not covered with a blanket, 
we adults will grab the blanket and cover us if, if we are getting cold. The babies don't have that ability, so they have the brown fat that is feeling that purpose. Uh, and, and, but we don't let the kids get cold anymore. We have those magic blankets and stuff like that. So as a result, they, they, they lose it. Um, can you touch on diet? Someone is asking, Diane is asking in, in the group. And uh, one question to start, I'm, uh, I'm always interested, not so much on what to eat, but how to eat and when to eat. And I think one of the narrative is too much about what is the right diet, but no one is thinking about what is my intention related to the food, or am I in parasympathetic? Am I relaxed? Am I able to actually incorporate the nutrients that I'm receiving in my body? And that has a lot to do with your emotional state and your resting uh, state. So yeah, just wonder if you want to talk a bit about that and then about the diet that, you know, out of all the diets out there are the ones that you have a good opinion about. Yeah, okay. So I'll separate this into two parts. One is what, what if you just wanted to lose weight and you didn't care about how healthy your diet was? You didn't care about any other parameter except for the number on the scales. If that's your only concern, then the only thing you have to worry about is how many carbon atoms you're putting in compared to coming out. And currently, a really simple way to make sure you're eating less carbon atoms than you're breathing out is to just count calories because calories are tied up between the atoms, that they live between the carbon and the hydrogen atoms. So if you're counting calories, you're sort of counting carbon atoms by proxy. And as long as you eat, you know, if you eat half of the recommended daily intake for your height, your weight, your gender, your age. If you eat half of what you should eat, you'll lose about 500 grams a week, half a kilo for sure, because you'll be breathing out more carbon atoms than you are eating. And, and that's I about 1,000 calorie because more or less it's about 2,000 right. calorie a day. So, you know, give and take, one, bring it down to 1,000 calorie a day. That's right. And look, I'm working on this calculator where instead of showing you how many calories there are, you can calculate. If you tell me how many grams of carbohydrates you, you are in a meal, um, for every 100 grams of carbohydrates, there's about 50 grams of carbon atoms. So I can tell you how many carbon atoms there are in any meal if you tell me how many carbs, protein, fat, and alcohol that you've had. Um, and that's it's really quite simple. It's um, just basic accounting, really. Um, so if all you care about is uh, losing weight, then, you know, what you eat and what time of day that you eat it, literally you could eat it all five minutes before you go to bed or you could eat it throughout stages of the day. That won't really have a big impact on how much weight you lose. It will have a massive impact on how you feel and how much you enjoy your life and all those, um, you know, all the things we really care about beyond just how much we weigh. So um, there are benefits that we know of to the fasting is a really beneficial thing to do for your body. And uh, the work of David Sinclair, who's now at Harvard, was at Uni of New South Wales, he's, he's written a whole book on this. Um, so, you know, the fact that we, we don't fully understand all the biochemical trickery that's going on that is so good for you if you fast regularly. Um, but it definitely does have benefits. I, I try not to, um, because I don't feel like I'm not a dietitian and I'm not a medical person either. So I don't try to uh, advise people on what they should or shouldn't eat. You know, should you go low carb? Should you just eat reduced um, calories? I really just say, try it. You know, if you like the sound of something, give it a go for a, a week or a month. If you love it, great. I've got heaps of friends who are... Um, uh, low carb. I've got a couple of friends who are full carnivores. They don't eat anything but meat. I've got other friends who are vegans. Um, so and I just let it be because um, they all have find benefits in their way of eating. So I, I don't like to give nutrition advice, but um, ultimately, no matter what you eat, you're going to turn it into carbon dioxide. That's the thing I just keep coming back to. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. I think that was quite an enlightening. And yeah, I think just having awareness of how we behave, how we breathe, how we... Um... One last question. People say sometimes when they do breath work that they are hungry after. Um, is there a relation between 
this on ghrelin, so the hormone of hunger, is that what's what's going on, or is it really okay, I've lost weight and I'm hungry? Um, what's uh, that's that's what that's a massively complicated. Same in the ice bath. So people people are hungry after an ice bath. They're starving. And my understanding is, and, and I also want your your take on that is yes, you produce ghrelin and you produce endocannabinoid, and endocannabinoid are related to ghrelin, these hormones of, of hunger. Do you want to? Yes. There's there's um at least in the last review that I read on this, because again, it's outside of my field of expertise, so I can only tell you what I've read, but there's 26 different hormones and peptides. The difference between a hormone and a peptide, a peptide is a, a bunch of amino acids joined together, which becomes a, sometimes a signaling molecule. So there's uh, 26 different kinds of molecules that push and pull on your appetite. So some of them, um, uh, appetite suppressants. So famously, things like serotonin. Anyone who's ever had MDMA knows all about the appetite suppression of, you know, those drugs that uh, release lots of serotonin and oxytocin and those. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, then there's another class of molecules which uh, give you an appetite, which raise your appetite. And so anyone who's smoked marijuana is famously aware of the fact that you get the munchies. Um, Drinking alcohol can also make you hungry after a few hours, you know, when you, you stop drinking and you suddenly have to eat. Um, so there's 26 different molecules that your own body makes that go into your blood and then either push or pull on your appetite. Ghrelin is released by your stomach. And then on top of those, there is the stretch receptors in your stomach, which can tell if your stomach is distended or, um, you know, empty. Um, and so the short answer is that no one really fully, there's, I don't think there's a scientist on planet Earth who would say, who would be brave enough to predict whether or not a particular activity would make you feel hungry or not hungry afterwards. And the way I explain it when I'm giving lectures about this stuff, um, and I put up the list of those different molecules, I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but there's 26 of them. Uh, the an interesting thing to re always remember is your emotional state has a massive impact on your appetite and the way to remember that is that if you you might be five minutes from lunch thinking geez i'm hungry i can't wait to eat if the phone rings and it's your best friend or one of your siblings and someone you know has just had a terrible accident you completely forget about eating your hunger goes away like that so appetite is extremely complicated um and whereas your weight is just how many atoms there are in your body you know so simple so simple but we overcomplicate uh weight i think a little bit with with all this knowledge that we sort of hear um for, for a lot of people i think they just they, they know, almost know too much they've heard too many different things and they just forget the simple fact that if you just eat less stuff that you then you breathe back out that's the key to everything. Thank you so much. That's an amazing uh, piece of advice. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for your time and for sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom. And I fully agree with you that, you know, we need to focus on kids and their education and fully support you. If people want to get in touch with you or follow your work, what's the best way uh, to find you? Oh, there's heaps of ways. Um, so I do, I do look at Instagram. I don't post very often, but I, I check it fairly often um, and I'm on Facebook but also if you want my email address it's easy to find that British Medical Journal article that I wrote it's almost eight years ago I think um, if you just type in when you lose weight where does the fat go you'll find my uh, journal article and my email address is smack bang on the front of that so yeah please do get in touch and um, it's very nice to hang out with a bunch of people who are so interested in breathing. I think it's great. It's, it's a really good development in the world that people are thinking about what happens when you breathe. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, making it to this call. And Ruben, send me all the, those links. I'm also interested if you can send me the link to, I think you mentioned the Heldine effect, something? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Send it to me because that's new to me. I'm, I'm curious to uh, share that with everyone as well. Um, it's, an, it's an always amazing how we keep learning exploring expanding there is so much uh in this topic so thank you if you enjoyed this call guys tell people to sign up to join the 
uh, monthly calls. We have another session at 6 p.m. Today, well, I'll give a summary of Ruben. So if you, uh, and then we'll share some breathing techniques. So if you are up, you can come at six o'clock Bali time and you can invite your friends to join as well. Otherwise, next month uh, we'll be there. All right. Thank you so much, Ruben. Have a great day, everyone. See you, everyone. Keep breathing. <laughs> Bye-bye. Keep breathing. Yes. See ya. You're right.